back for our final um, session of the afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the discussion panel will comprise the three afternoon speakers and plus Gerard McCrane of McCrane and Lavington. And I hope that uh, the speakers from this morning will, will feel able to uh, contribute also. Um, but before that, um, our final speaker uh, is Natalie de Vries, who um, I suppose first became uh, known uh, in this country uh, for some of the extraordinarily beautiful housing um, that Mekanu were doing uh, in the early 1990s. And I think uh, for, for the people here who are still publishing um, a diet either of um, expensive Oxbridge colleges uh, or trying to avoid publishing anything at all that was being produced by the volume house builders, uh, to see these examples coming in from the Netherlands was uh, wonderful. Um, well, in 1991, she co-founded MVRDV, um, where she's a partner. Um, like many other speakers today, um, she also teaches as well as designs. And um, she's going to be talking about um, her practices, ideas in relation to the compact city and also a uh, wonderful phrase, low density uh, urbanism or LDU, as I imagine the uh, journalists will be rapidly describing it as, uh, and specifically in reference to their Sailor Dam project. Natalie de Vries. Uh, can I have the first slides, please? Um, due to the fact that um, we have only um, started to practice, actually practice our office um, only four and a half years ago, I cannot show you any uh, uh, realized uh, work uh, on Phoenix uh, locations. Uh, I can only show you uh, tender drawings and some uh, models and schemes. Um, that has uh, to do with the fact that um, when the office began, um, the private developer were not uh, interested in giving us commissions. We didn't. We had built anything, and that's uh, that's one of the most important uh, 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 rules for developers to to choose architects. But um, we did get commission uh, from a, from a social housing uh, company, and that's also quite. Uh, Quite typical, I think, uh, in the in the past, uh, this 30% uh, of, uh, of social housing in Holland has been made partly by, by very young architects because the social housing companies were much more interested in experimenting and were, of course, uh, less afraid of, uh, of uh, the fact that the houses might not get sold because they simply were rented out to, uh, to the people. So uh, I sandwiched the, the Saturday project uh, into uh, two uh, low-rise uh, projects that we made. And uh, the first slides I, uh, I'm showing you now are, um, are I think, yeah, that's, that's the right size. Um, one slide on the left is um, showing a little bit um, the fear maybe that we that we have in Holland although some of the speakers today said they didn't they didn't they didn't think it was uh, really fearsome about how uh, Holland is uh, developing its its building uh, plans we're not we're not only building houses and and Phoenix houses we're also building uh, uh, offices we're building uh, lots of other buildings and in the past 10 years when you Pass highways. You can uh, drive on highways. You can uh, you can see that um, Holland is slowly being filled with a kind of uh, soup of uh, of mediocrity, as we uh, as we call it sometimes. Um, there is a, a seemingly an, in a, a kind of um, never-ending amount of of soil to to build on. On one hand, and on the other hand, the Dutch uh, seem to have a uh, big uh, fear of heights or vertigo, so uh, they tend not to go beyond uh, four stories uh, uh, with the buildings, on average. So, um, yeah, we we want to take uh, take a position in this uh, as as architects. We did it right from the beginning. We will be publishing a book about it this year. It's called Far Max. 
Uh, another uh, thing I want to, to tell you about um, is, uh, is the right slide, is that the fact that the Dutch people are at the moment uh, moving, moving from house to house with an average of seven times per lifetime already. So that means that um, you uh, buy a house more or less maybe with the same, start to buy a house and that's it, increasing, more or less with the same speed as you are buying a car or, uh, and that, that, that's only uh, increasing already. So on the issue of lifestyles, this is also an important uh, aspect. Uh, we are uh, used already to, to uh, when, we have w when we are uh, getting to a different phase of our life or financing, uh, finances change that we uh, simply move the house. We leave the other one and we find a new one. Uh, so that makes the, the house itself uh, also something completely different because uh, the things uh, we do there um, are more related to a certain phase in our lives than, uh, than the fact that we have to do everything through all the phases of our life in this uh, house. Another thing I want to show you, I can't show you buildings, but I can show you people who uh, have to live there. This is, uh, these are two photographs of Dutch girls um, made by two photographers who started a couple of years ago to make an inventory of the Dutch youth culture styles. And uh, they have now uh, developed that into photographing almost everybody in Holland, also grandmothers and managers and nightclub bouncers. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, the reason why I show you these pictures is because um, this, individually, this individuality also has another side to it. And these photographers uh, try to design a kind of framework in which they, a kind of collective framework in which they uh, photographed all these individual people who are also in their individual ways becoming members again of, of, of groups, of, um, of, of larger uh, groups. So, on the one hand, there's individuality, but on the other hand, we're also closely watching uh, our schoolmates and our neighbors and our, our friends. Ne Next two. I want to start, um, and, and, and that's also the reason why I called uh, my lecture a little bit provocatively uh, the new collectivity, because uh, on, the on one hand, we are uh, individualizing to some extent. But on the other hand, uh, as like the photographers, uh, we as architects and urbanists are still having uh, the task to, to make a collective arrangements of these, uh, all these people. We are putting them in buildings, we are putting them in, in urban schemes, and uh, so we have to find kind of common, common, uh, common uh, nominations between all these uh, individuals. Uh, I sandwiched my Saladin project uh, with between two, uh, two, uh, two other projects. Uh, like I said in the beginning uh, of the office, we only got uh, commissions from uh, social housing companies and from municipalities and from private uh, clients. This was a study we made in 1995. The Rotterdam was, uh, was trying to um, was asking architects to look 50 years in the future, 50 years after the uh, war ended. Eh? So there's, there had been a development of 50 years, and now they asked architects to, um, to think about what life, and particularly housing, would be like in 2045. And we were asked, together with uh, Arnold Rijndorp and an uh, ecolo ecological architect, to investigate uh, life in 2045 in a Phoenix, uh, on a Phoenix site. This site is in the south of, uh, of Rotterdam. So this is Rotterdam, this is the area uh, between uh, two small towns, Barendrecht and, uh, and Rome, uh, where already a scheme was uh, made for this Phoenix uh, area, filling half of the, half of the uh, let's say, patch in this uh, landscape on the south side of, of Rotterdam. It was uh, at that time, people already knew that it would not be like one of the, the top Phoenix spots. It was on the south side, and not a lot of it was not 
uh, particularly interesting, it was south side of the Randstad, not particularly interesting or, or with, with any special uh, features. Uh, the only uh, attraction was that it was simply was near, near Rotterdam. The plan was made in, a, in, a, in an average Phoenix uh, density of the 28 or 30 houses per square meter, with some densification around uh, a public transport uh, system. That's a very common, uh, common way of, uh, of, uh, of paying for this uh, transport system. The other half of, the, of this patch, this island, would be kept uh, so-called empty as a kind of uh, counterbalance of this area. Only this empty area would be too small for farmers to have a, have a good functioning uh, farm. And <coughs> it was quite a mediocre area with already some second-hand car uh, dealers. And uh, well, it's not particularly uh, exciting. So, so what we asked ourselves is if we look at 2045, the next situation might be might be simply this. There's the next uh, Phoenix operation uh, being made. Um, but on the other hand, uh, this density of 28 or 30 houses per, per hectare seemed to be quite, uh, quite fixed. It has to do with a lot of financial uh, matters uh, mainly, combining uh, the amount of uh, money with the amount of houses that had to be uh, made in Holland. Uh, we made a little analysis of how the money and how, no, how the soil was being used according to all the percentages that were given. Uh, this is all uh, highly regulated, the amount of uh, streets and, 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 and common uh, green and houses and gardens that you uh, have to make. As you can see, the actual house and garden are uh, only half, use only half of the, of the, of the size of uh, of the of the lot of the of the ground of the location, and that leads to um, to areas where every individual, as such, is being uh, kind of uh, seduced with uh, with funny architecture and nice different roofs and stuff, but they all have a kind of tiny garden in front of the house, more or less the same size, and uh, yeah, this this kind of average sprawl. This is, this is supposed to be one of the most successful uh, housing areas in Holland, in Amersfoort. Um, it is, um, of Almere, yeah. And um, it's, uh, well, exemplary, you could say. So what we did was we tried to investigate if we uh, want to live in suburban conditions, why are we uh, accepting uh, accepting the conditions that, uh, that we saw in the last picture, uh, be it s either anti-urban or suburban or sort of urban. We investigated how we could change that into a real suburbanity, because that's what we, uh, what we focused on. And we decided to use, to use the whole site instead of only half of the, of the Phoenix site and use the empty area fill it already with, uh, with houses, with larger gardens. We could do that by, um, by a, a kind of financial, uh, financial uh, trick. So this is all theoretical, but I assure you that it's quite, uh, it's quite reasonable. Uh, we discovered that a lot of the money that we spent on housing disappears into the ground. It disappears uh, also in, in streets. The, the width of streets, because of uh, firemen, uh, had to have to go up and down the streets. Uh, the amount of infrastructure that we put into the ground. Uh, and it's even so that the infrastructure and the streets patterns are, uh, have a longer lifespan than, than the actual houses themselves. So even after the houses are already demolished, you do not take away the infrastructure because it's still, uh, still uh, worth uh, a lot of money. So what we did is that we uh, tried to rearrange this infrastructure. We suggested to, um, to get rid of uh, the sewage system, but do it in a, in a different uh, way with, with reed and, uh, and water basins. We uh, kind of uh, predicted that, uh, that the tele uh, telematic uh, revolution would continue and that we would not need all those uh, things in the house. We uh, made the houses more self-supporting. 
we, uh, and uh, most important, we made them uh, lightweight so that you don't use very heavy, uh, heavy foundation, but only light foundation, which also saves uh, a lot of money. And we uh, took away a lot of the streets and replaced them by sand uh, paths because uh, could already now a lot of people like to drive four-wheel drive cars and <laughs> might be uh, a good reason to buy one. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, you won't be able to reach your house. And this whole exercise would lead to other houses with a very much bigger garden. So for the same amount of money that you would spend on, on, the, on the house in the last picture, you could buy uh, a lot and, and have, have, a, have a really big garden. Uh, or uh, we could make a kind of communal green area where the house would be placed in, uh, much like a kind of holiday uh, resort house. So the, 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 the green space would be collectively owned by the people who, uh, who live there. And this was, uh, this was some of the images we created to, to show this. Eh? This is especially this, this area with the communal forest uh, in between. Camping land, as we called it. Um, with the same pass. And another way of dealing with this, uh, the, the municipality asked us to look on it from a couple of sides, let's say a more uh, liberal side and a more uh, socialist uh, side. We could also imagine that uh, smaller communities would be formed, which would have uh, a, a unique uh, feature uh, somehow, uh, much linked to, to, a, to a harbor or to the highway or to to some kind of uh, common, uh, maybe maybe a factory would adopt or, or, or build a house, uh, a village, and that these uh, villages would be strong enough to kind of withhold, withstand building activities in their uh, in their surroundings. And the third option we uh, we designed were kind of collective uh, buildings, uh, condominiums as we call them, with. Um, with also some collective uh, uh, features in the in the block, a, a communal roof, terrace, or, or a garden, or some sporting facilities, something uh, which would make this apartment uh, or this condominium uh, special and different from the from the other ones. And we even applied this scheme on a, on another study we did for the for the municipality of uh, Amsterdam, where we asked to make a plan for a building in the in the River I. And uh, so instead of, uh, of building, uh, well it doesn't reach that far, I think. Instead of, instead of making new land, we uh, put the condominiums in the middle of the water so that the uh, views from the city to the eye would, would remain. And, uh, and instead of a, a garden or some public street, you would have the water of the eye surrounding your, uh, your house. And this, this last, uh, of no, the, the, the first project I showed you, we called light, light urbanism, because it's also light in a sense that um, since we do not make this heavy investment and it, we uh, do not use so much material to build all these houses, it's also easy when uh, for some uh, reason, uh, or demographical or economical, uh, uh, we want to build in completely different ways we can erase, completely erase this, this neighborhood and, and uh, start again. And so we're not stuck with, for example, all the infrastructure which is already there and put in the ground. From this uh, commission to uh, study, make a study of this infill of, the, of this uh, area here, we were asked to, uh, invited to participate in a competition to build a building next to two existing uh, silos um, a new silo, one could say, uh, also in the River Eye, and we uh, we won that uh, competition. The interesting thing about this, uh, so this was actually the first condominium that we could really uh, build. The interesting thing of it was that it was uh, at an enormously uh, visual spot in Amsterdam. From the building, you could see uh, the. Uh, the station and even beyond that, uh, well, it was quite exciting. It was actually building in the river. We were to build it at the end of a, of a sort of pier, the, the dam. 
But by building it there, we would uh, also more or less destroy the feeling that you have when you walk into the water and, and have this uh, fantastic view. So what we, what, we, uh, what we proposed, that you see on the right, on this right schedule, is to simply extend this dam through the building and then you would be again having an end of the dam, uh, public space, being able to have the sensation of standing in the middle of the, of the water. The size of the building was, uh, was fixed by the municipality. It had to be 20 meters deep and about 10 stories uh, high to match the volumes of the existing uh, silos. And we also got an enormous amount of program to, uh, to fill it with, so it, it was indeed completely filled if we would build all these uh, things. In the competition, we, uh, we were given this uh, brief on the left, and to, for the Dutch audience, it might look uh, very familiar. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's let's say, uh, a very uh, politically correct mix of, uh, of program. It has uh, cheap houses, uh, uh, average priced houses and expensive houses. And that's uh, what's been said here. And the differences is, are that they have uh, three or four uh, categories of, of rooms, from two to five. And that these, room, that these houses have different sizes. And um, so the only difference between, uh, in the program between uh, a cheap three house uh, apartment, a three room apartment and, uh, and a three room expensive apartment is simply the, the size of the apartment. And next to that they also wanted to, to mix the, the building with uh, public functions, with offices, and uh, even with some uh, urban transparency whatever that might, uh, might be, because uh, the neighborhood uh, on the uh, adjacent neighborhood wanted to be able to see the eye uh, still after the building was built. Now what we, uh, what we did was, uh, we knew that the, the we had m a multiple client, it was a social housing company and a private developer, developer and also the municipality played a, still a large role in this, uh, in this period. So what we did is we, uh, we tried to invent uh, a system which was quite uh, flexible. And uh, most of all what we did was that we uh, decided that we would ignore the words cheap, middle, expensive and expensive, but that we would translate that into uh, very different housing types. So a house could be uh, either very, uh, very deep and have a view on, on both sides, or could be uh, very wide and have a panoramic view. It could have two stories. It could have a half a story. It could be uh, it could be uh, situated around a corridor or uh, a gallery or simply an elevator. It could have uh, different uh, floor to ceiling uh, height. And so the the big differences between the house would not simply be its three bedroom and its its larger or, or its smaller, but the difference would be the the spatial quality uh, of the house. And this, we, uh, we think, is uh, actually much more uh, realistic because people nowadays are not only looking for the amount of rooms that they get, but they're especially looking for, for a type of space that they want to, that they want to live in. And uh, if they, some people only want a, a pied à terre with a very, uh, very fantastic bathroom and others uh, want to have as much space and height as possible, but also as cheap as possible. So um, that's why uh, we think that the whole differentiation in price classes is uh, slightly, uh, well, not, not of this time anymore. The, the other parts of the program, we also uh, kind of fitted in the same uh, system, which also fitted uh, the way we would construct uh, the building. And uh, so we also would have a, par uh, a sports hall, a, a little harbor, a playground, maybe some gardens, a restaurant. Uh, and um, an important thing of these, uh, these, these little patches is that we organized a type, not as, a, as, a, as an individual uh, type in the building, but we grouped them around what we called sort of mini neighborhoods. So you would always have three or four uh, neighbors which would have bought the same type of house as you have. 
Like I said, when we entered the competition, we knew we had a kind of multiple-headed uh, client, quite classical in already in the Dutch situation, it's a public-private uh, partnership, uh, one could say. But what we did not know is how they wanted to mix the program. Um, would it be um, more towards kind of market uh, market value, like on, and the top houses are more expensive than the, than the bottom houses? Or would they be socially segregated so that every uh, price, uh, the, the differences between the prices of the houses would be seen that you have a different entrance to the building? Or would it be politically correct, uh, as you could say, and uh, the whole thing would be mixed? So that's the top scheme, uh, scheme on the right. We uh, suggested, of course, the, the top scheme because, like I said, by uh, defining by defining the, the program more into difference of space and spatial quality instead of uh, simply the size and the price, we thought uh, that the, the differences between the classes would no longer uh, be, uh, be relevant. This is, uh, let's say, the organization, uh, the scheme that you, uh, you get. Uh, it's more or less four, uh, four for parts, and uh, in each part, one part was taken out by us for the urban uh, transparency. Could be a collective space on top, like a communal balcony or, or, or kindergarten. It was a restaurant or, or office space sticking out of the building where the public terrace was on. Uh, there was a little harbor uh, at the bottom, so that from the, from the silo dam you could watch through the building. Uh, and that was put in every, every block. When we, uh, when we got the commission, when we won the competition, uh, the system we developed seemed to prove to be uh, successful. The program of the, of the competition, so on the left side, showed uh, a variety of types, and we ordered them here by size of the house, that's horizontal and vertically, the amount of houses in that uh, type, the client immediately suggested that we move that program a little bit, uh, so the sizes of the houses slightly changed towards this Gauss, uh, Gauss curve, because most houses that have to be made have to be around 100 or 90 to 100 square meters. So they allowed us to invent a lot of t uh, different types in, uh, in this middle range, uh, and let's say a little bit more on the, on the, on the edges of this uh, curve. But I didn't say which one should be expensive and which one should be cheap. So we have expensive small houses and uh, cheap big houses and vice versa. This is, a, this is an image where all these uh, houses are put together. We were, um, I think, um, uh, lucky that uh, one of the clients was, um, was a social housing uh, corporation because um, in the beginning, um, the original uh, task was, of course, to build good quality social housing. And in this, uh, but like uh, now the phrase already explained, they uh, have now much more to say about the type of houses they build. They have a lot of money and uh, they, uh, they get much more freedom. And in this uh, process, they develop themselves into uh, a client who is uh, with, with a kind of social conscience. So they were the ones who, who kind of uh, guarded the, the most important aspect of this plan, which is the enormous diversity of the types. And they helped to convince the other client, the developer, to actually make this, uh, make this project. So it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, change, change of task, I guess, for the for the social housing corporations, the public housing corporations. Uh, they become a kind of uh, socially conscious uh, uh, client for us. Another uh, thing we did, which is, uh, which, uh, which is important, is that we um, not only made all these uh, special areas in the building, uh, between the, li uh, the, the small neighborhoods, uh, but where we also connect them all together so that you have a kind of route, route through the building from one uh, particular area to the other. So if you're living on the bottom or the top, you can always uh, go to 
to, to an area which is uh, completely different than, than, uh, than the situation of your own uh, house. Uh, we decided that the, that the whole image could be like a package of different housing types. If we call it, uh, as a joke, it's almost a museum of, so of, uh, of housing types. That when you make these excursions in the future to different housing topologies, you only have to visit this, this project and you would have seen them, uh, seen them all. Um, we like to, we'd like to show on the facade the different uh, little neighborhoods that we, uh, that we make, the different housing types. The windows would be completely, uh, yeah, uh, only uh, not, uh, formed by, uh, by the internal uh, logic of the, of the project. So a panorama house, a white house, would have uh, a wide window, there would be ateliers with big glass uh, windows, etc., etc. That would all be packed together. I'm, I'm going to show you now some of the, some of the uh, work we did uh, so far. Like I said, one of the communal holes in the building is, uh, is at the bottom. Uh, it's the entrance uh, of the building. You can go through that, uh, through that uh, diagonal space to the restroom, but you can also go on top to the, uh, to the balcony. This space is still heavily debated. Should it be able to, be to close it off or not at night? So that's uh, something which I think we, the, the day today was maybe a bit pink in color and a bit happy and cheerful, but I think we should not, uh, not deny the fact that uh, Holland is, uh, let's say, not, 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 not a complete paradise, so even we have to uh, <laughs> consider sometimes if it's socially safe to, uh, to have, uh, to have such, a, such a space. So we have to uh, really uh, work on the design of that area. To, uh, to prevent it from being closed off. On the other hand, we are uh, very lucky that, like I said, the municipality is playing an important role and they, uh, they really help us to, uh, to force <laughs> almost the clients to keep this space communal, to keep it uh, open. Now, communal is maybe a wrong word, public, publicly accessible. Uh, another space is, is a little harbor under the under the building, on the right side is the is the dam. You see it there, sticking out. So it's basically just one of the elements that we moved out of the building into the water. In the dam will be a parking uh, garage. This is uh, inside of this restaurant and on top of the balcony, looking back to uh, where the station uh, could be seen. And I go now inside uh, of the building to make it possible to uh, make almost 20, I think, different uh, housing types. We had to be very severe on the, on the construction uh, of the building. So we have a, 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 four, a 5 meter 40 span, uh, which is made of uh, either walls or uh, wall-like uh, beams. In this case, it's, uh, it's, it's walls. Uh, and... Um, we also have a system of uh, shafts go running through the building, uh, so it's possible in the middle area to connect bathrooms and kitchens to this uh, shaft. They are basically uh, everywhere in the building. The right type I showed you is, uh, is one, I'm, I'm now going to kind of zap along uh, some of the housing types. This is a type just uh, above the water, which has a, has a big, uh, Double height space uh, at, the, at the water side. It's two story house. These are again two completely different ones. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a studio, it's a relatively cheap house on one side, and a very, very big one which we named after a quite luxurious street in Amsterdam, Valerius. It's quite expensive uh, a five room uh, uh, house uh, with two stories. One of them uh, is uh, connected to the corridor, the other has her own uh, galerij, as we call it, gallery. Valeriastraat, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> nou, wie weet. <laughs> Genoeg uh, kamers voor alle kinderen. Uh, yeah, because um, one of the main uh, issues in, in, uh, in, in uh, making um, projects inside the city is 
uh, how, do, uh, how do cities attract families with children to stay in, in the city? Um, it's become quite common that as soon as people get children that they leave the city and go and live in one of these uh, suburbs. That has many, uh, many reasons. Safety is one. Uh, the children, the, the schools, that's also something I think we should uh, not forget that also in Holland we start to drag children around neighborhoods and areas and cities to take them to the school that you think is uh, suitable with your uh, social uh, position, position in society. Uh, so um, in this project a number of bigger houses were made so that you can live there with your, uh, with your family. These people are important for the city because they're usually a little bit richer and spend m some more money. And yeah, this whole layer of people of 30, 40 years old is sometimes uh, completely disappearing from inner cities. And uh, that's also a tendency that the Dutch try to, uh, try to uh, prevent. Um, yeah, yet another type, there are uh, houses for seniors. They have a quite uh, specific uh, ground plan, which all the architects here know by heart. Uh, and uh, on the right, a house with two stories where you can also work in. Another house which has two sides, but one of the sides is on the other side of the block than the other. It's kind of crossing in, crossed in, the, in the block. Like the houses, we also differentiated the the, the corridors and, and the, the whole way you, you, you enter, enter your house, um, which can be double height or double width or whatever. One of the uh, big spaces in the building was a big balcony in the building, which later on was filled with, uh, atelier, uh, with atelier houses. We had a very big uh, fight about this space. Um, it was a communal space. All the people in the, who were buying a house in the block would have to pay for it, for its maintenance, for its size in a way, because the, their house would be more expensive. Um, the client did like the fact, the clients did like the fact that it was, that you get for everybody in the building this magnificent view over the, over the river Eye. On the other hand, they claimed that the Dutch do not like uh, communal areas in their uh, building. They're, uh, they're not prepared to pay uh, for that. Um, somehow, um, yeah, they don't want to be in a collective space with their neighbors uh, in the building. Uh, roof terraces, uh, people claimed, are, are not on these buildings, are not interesting, because only the people on the top floor uh, kind of take it as their own balcony. Nobody else in the building uh, goes there. So um, maybe, it's, maybe it's a typical architect's dream that uh, you want to have communal spaces in, uh, <laughs> in your building. It's a kind of Corbusian, uh, Corbusian infusion you get, maybe uh, during your education or whenever, I don't know. Um, I spoke to a, to a makelaar, what's that in? Uh, a real estate agent uh, recently and I asked her, um, is it true? Is it, is it really true that you, you can't sell a house with a communal uh, sauna or a swimming pool? Or and she said, yeah, well, no, the Amsterdam people really hate the idea that it would be in a swimming pool together with their neighbors. No way. We, never, we would never sell this uh, apartment. We, they had some examples and, and nobody, uh, everybody's paying for these facilities, but nobody's uh, using them. So apparently uh, our clients were speaking the truth. And on top, of course, uh, we use the special. Uh, yeah, so we, we try to give every house, uh, make uh, every house special, and, and the ones on the top uh, get a patio. It's this one. Uh, the whole image of the building is, of course, uh, related to uh, to this uh, these things. On one hand, uh, you can make a unity out of difference, which is uh, yeah, part of the harbor harbor image, and on the other hand, it's uh, it's done uh, it's done before already many times. Uh, so um, 
Like I said, the building system is very straightforward. We only have walls and a column grid and the shafts, which allows us to differentiate an enormous amount. Uh, the facades are completely flat, filled with uh, mainly woods, wooden uh, prefabricated panels, and then uh, cladded with different materials in such a way that you can still recognize all the different types of houses. It's going from brick to wood to, uh, to panels. And, and this is the, the image. It's not, uh, it's not a selling picture. It would be probably even uh, more glamorous, but it's a picture we made uh, ourselves. Back uh, shows the image of the building standing in the, in the river. And um, to the right, we see that the municipality is using all its strength to develop, to develop the, the public space on the, on the dam. And it's actually, uh, on the right, you see the design is already incorporating part of the building and showing it as a, as a public, uh, public area, which of course helps us again in our negotiations with our, uh, with our client. So we, we uh, benefit extremely from the fact that we have this, uh, this group of clients, actually. The last thing I want to show you, uh, some, some of it you already saw this morning, is um, at last, like I said, after uh, <laughs> four years, we uh, have proven that we can build. So we are asked by, by private developers uh, for the real Vinex uh, locations. So uh, we, join, uh, we join the Dutch uh, Architects uh <laughs> Guild. And we uh, compromise, um, one could say, because we are always shouting in, in lectures beforehand and instead of like, be next, that's, well, what should we make of that? So here for the first time, we were actually asked to, uh, to elaborate uh, a real Vinex uh, scheme. And uh, it was quite a struggle. To, uh, to begin with, we got a box with about 20 booklets from all the different uh, clients, from the municipalities, four municipalities, I think, from, uh, from uh, the fire department, from the handicapped uh, regulations. Uh, Fritz Palmboom himself also made a booklet of five or six, I think, <laughs> about the, the materials to use, about the profiles of the islands, about, uh, well, many, 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 many things. <laughs> So uh, one could say that the brief was, uh, was ev equally complicated as the brief for the, for the building I just showed you. It's, it's more or less the same. It's also with the same diversity of, uh, of, uh, of social uh, mixture of housing. And um, the, the, the general scheme that he, uh, he showed in, in models and uh, Fritz Palmer showed in models and in, uh, in plans had in it an enormous amount of row houses with, with pitched uh, roofs. Now if we compare that again with, with the last scheme I showed you and with the, with the study uh, we did before, uh, one could say that we are not so much interested in this kind of uh, atomizing the housing in all these different small units, but that we, we try uh, to make different living conditions and uh, in this scheme, it resulted in such a way that we, uh, that we gave all the different islands and groups of islands their own, uh, their own atmosphere. Uh, so I'm going to quickly jump through this, over these islands uh, with you. So this is uh, about 900 uh, houses. Uh, like Kees already said, uh, schools or shops were not, uh, were not an issue. I, um, they were sort of there, um, situated somewhere. <laughs> uh, no sign of, uh, of, of, any, uh, of any of that. And um, what we did indeed was to make different, different types of conditions. In this island, we, uh, we came back to this idea of the water filtering uh, system again. Uh, on this, uh, in this area, it might have been uh, even more uh, with all these amounts of water. It could have gone much further than it actually uh, is uh, now, but well, still we added a lot of weed to, uh, to improve, uh, improve the conditions. Um, like I said, uh, a lot of uh, regulations were already uh, fixed, but on these smaller islands, the, the size of the islands more or less prevented us 
uh, and especially declined for making typical housing schemes because the depth of the house was also uh, only about nine or, or ten meters. So that meant that our, our clients, our private developers, had uh, a lot of uh, typical plans, but none of them could be used <laughs> simply because uh, the topology didn't uh, fit. So uh, that's a good idea, Fritz. <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is again such a such a such an area. Here we, uh, on the last one, we showed uh, more individual uh, houses, uh, two in a, in a row. Here we made kind of almost little factories around the, uh, around the common uh, green, where the where the where the houses are, are almost in the in the water. Uh, then a more uh, urban type, one could say. It's it's very dense. People who are going to live in suburban areas are not necessarily uh, gardeners or people who love to uh, to have their own uh, garden. Uh, <coughs> like um, Arnold already explained uh, this morning, uh, it's not really sure if the inhabitants of these areas are in fact urban or suburban by uh, by nature. So this is an area with, uh, which is very dense and where the people uh, mainly have patios. And the whole island looks again as one bigger building because it's all surrounded by uh, by one wall. And the last one is uh, this one, which is uh, highly individualized. So it was a, a big struggle again with the client because the building costs would be uh, could be uh, rather excessive if we put every house apart. Uh, and which what is also important in this one is that we left that we left the street in the middle out. So you enter your house through, through a kind of narrow path from, uh, from the street. And that you are really, this is, this is the opposite of the, of the patio uh, people. These people love gardening. They want to be <laughs> in the middle of it day, day and night. Um, another Phoenix project that we got is, is, a, is a designing a mall. Which is which is very which I'm not showing you. It's an Im important topic as well because uh, we know from from the states that these malls can lead to, yeah, let's say a kind of new type of social uh, social uh, atmosphere in uh, in neighborhoods. Uh, the big discussion there is also uh, a kind of global issue: is whether you internalize uh, internalize everything. Yeah, it's kind of controlled area where the shops can be only reached from the inside, where the doors can close uh, at night. And, uh, and also the issue of a kind of museumification of, uh, of public space. Uh, a lot of the shopping malls built nowadays look like more or less old cities, but are in fact uh, completely new and huge, uh, huge structures. Okay, with this I, I'd like to end my, uh, my question and I, I hope that I've showed you a little bit what Arnold Reindop already calls uh, that the organization of individuality might be a collective uh, process. <coughs> Thank you. Answers and discussions. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Gerard McCrane just to kick us off with one question. I'm going to come back to him later to ask him um, a, a simple but big question, which is what are the prospects of the sorts of things we've seen today happening uh, in Britain on any sort of scale. But before coming, before coming to that, um, can I ask you whether there are things you've heard today um, or, or of tales that have been recounted or methods described which have surprised you um, or that you didn't know about already, and if so, what they were? Um, no, I, I think most of what I've seen I'm quite aware of. I should also say that what we've seen today is, is the best uh, of uh, what's happening in the Netherlands and there's an awful lot of stuff which is very mediocre uh, indeed and in a, in a way maybe that's a, different, that's a different subject. Right, thanks for that. I'm going to throw it open to you now. So ask away, if you'd like to kick us off with a question or a comment.
Hugo Hinsey, I'm going to pick on you. You got that? Yeah. One factor to pick out of uh, what was discussed this morning and, and which is coming back again today is this shift in the Netherlands uh, towards more market housing and, and how that might change the way in which urban or suburban development works. And whether in that individualization that comes out of a more market driven and less social driven program of housing whether the individuals will choose the collective, uh, the more urban, the sort of thing that the architects have talked today would like to be designing, or whether it will slip more and more towards uh, a mass suburban uh, culture. And one point that was mentioned right at the beginning, or, or was even alluded to, but was not picked up on, was a public discussion about architecture and about the quality and culture of architecture. Uh, I think Nud was for a time a director of a foundation trying to promote that debate. And it's one of the things that, that's very difficult in England but seems to be more possible in the Netherlands is uh, a general discussion about what it is that people are looking for in terms of the quality if this shift is going on, if we're uh, there is an opportunity to rethink the urban and the suburban. There is a shift from a housing model that was very dominated by the public sector uh, towards one that is much more open, so the individuals are going to be choosing. Is there a rich debate other than amongst this sort of uh, high-pressure group uh, of architects and urbanists and, and clients uh, that might actually indicate there was a positive move towards finding a new suburban urbanism or a new urban suburbanism uh, that the individuals wouldn't simply vote with their feet and get their car and go and buy uh, a mass-produced uh, developer's suburban unit, but that they would choose to live in some of the types of ways that are being shown in, in, in the projects. Okay, the inevitable march of uh, individualization, market forces, and uh, you know, consumer culture in quotes, or something that is uh, still up for serious debate uh, with the input of the people who are designing the buildings one way or the other. Michelle, any comment on that? Now, let's say, first of all, um, let's say the market has, or has a very kind of notorious connotation, apparently, here in uh, Britain due to uh, what is it, 17 years uh, Thatcherism. So I do understand that, that this has this strange connotation. But at the other hand, uh, the market has also some positive aspects. If, if you're um, thinking about individualization and if you're thinking about developing uh, new neighborhoods, if you uh, develop uh, houses somewhere in the range between uh, 50,000 pounds and 150,000 pounds. Due to that already, uh, people are able to make their own decision whether they're going to buy it or not, and whether they're going to uh, whether they are able to buy it. So that already gives, first of all, market-driven or not, it gives uh, social differentiation. It gives uh, uh, differentiation in demand, but it also gives a differentiation in uh, terms or in uh, at num the number of years they're going to occupy the dwelling because what Natalie claimed that people are mo moving f faster and faster from one house to the other also has to do with pricing of houses uh, so uh, eventually people uh, are tend to tend to buy a, a cheap house in the beginning of their life and when they have a, a better income, they move to another house. And due to that, you also get differentiation and, and different kinds of neighborhoods with different people. So it's not a matter of, it's not a matter that, that we want to organize collectives. It's also not a matter that we are social engineers. It's just a matter that these things go without noticing. Natalie DeVries. Yeah. And uh, one could say that the, the market uh, parties have uh, discovered difference as a, as a selling point. So uh, we all have learned from the, from the past that, that uh, building enormous amounts of uh, houses uh, which are identical 
uh, is uh, nowadays when, like like we said, people easily move to to another house if the if the, if the, if the current house doesn't fit them, uh, makes them more uh, cautious in uh, in building too much of the same. So even the mediocrity of of, of a lot of Phoenix sites. Uh, the developers are discovering that it's that it's not good, so they're inviting, uh, they're they're asking architects to make different architecture from the mediocrity, and I think that's also good because uh, the 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 enormous amount of repetition that we made in the past also provokes the social problems that uh, that some some of you were talking about uh, this morning. Eh? So uh, that's also why areas when they become more mixed uh, are somehow more uh, more balanced also. In social ways. Just, Thank co you. just coming back on that, yep. in, in relation to what you were saying about the Silodum project, where you made the point, I think, several times that it was very important that there was the government, local government, and the housing association clients there, in a way, supporting your agenda, because the market side of it was actually much more conservative, and, and they didn't want to have the collective spaces, they didn't want to have the public access. Uh, the ground level and so on. Well, they so wanted to play a little bit on the safe side. They mm. discovered there were some types which they would sell any minute, and this is Amsterdam, it's in the water, they could sell, you know, anything probably, but they, they, they realized that some of the types were, were hugely successful, and they could send for, for an enormous sell for an enormous amount of money. Uh, and now, at this moment, there's a competition among real estate agents how to sell this uh, building, and, and some of them already told me that it's yeah, that they, 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 they really simply love the fact that it has so many different types of houses. So from the market side, that's, it's also accepted now. And of course, I must say, this is in Amsterdam, and it's kind of microcosmos, of course. It is much more uh, metropolitan <coughs> town than, than any other town in, in Amsterdam. So that's why we can make this extreme uh, variety in, in one block. Uh, Kees Christian, sir. Yes, that, the, um, it's so it, that's true. It is so that in uh, the high... Uh, density areas in the Randstad, uh, you can almost sell anything that you build. Um, and in large parts of the rest of the country, you can't. Uh, it's very important to notice that, because it is indeed so that uh, all this uh, so-called experimental modern architecture and urban uh, designs are only limited to uh, a limited surface uh, and a limited amount of cities uh, in uh, the country. And it is also so that um, the uh, success of uh, uh, exp so-called experiment, I don't know if we can, some things are experiments, some are not, of experiment um, are directly connected uh, with exploitation figures uh, as well on the uh, level of the urban design as well as the on, the on the level of the dwelling. As soon as you make houses that are uh, performing less in, in terms of service uh, than uh, or use uh, functional use uh, possibilities, then uh, traditional housings, you fall out of it. So it means that uh, the, this uh, experiment or, or this kind of transformation of types, a big good example is uh, Neuterling's office who uh, first always show the traditional type and, and then tell you how they transform it into something better, but you can always see that they perform um, at least the performance of the previous type because otherwise it would never be accepted. So those, those are two very important uh, items to, uh, to know because uh, that means that, uh, that it uh, is on a limited basis and that you can only perform better uh, in order to have success. And uh, further, uh, what is a very important aspect is that the generation, uh, the uh, thus uh, generating uh, generation of uh, variety uh, is, is uh, made out of a culture and this culture um, is more or less um, in, in this culture architecture is more or less uh, used like fashion and this is uh, an aspect that real estate agents use to promote it so it has a kind of a, a self accelerating uh, effect um, and, but the, the very most important factor uh, of all this, uh, this, uh, these developments is the fact that in Holland the decision makers are average 10 years younger than in other countries and this is the result of the 1968 revolution. Um, the 1968 revolution has wiped out uh, all the major decision makers um, around the 1970s um, on the, on, in the field of, uh, of, uh, of uh, public design. And uh, it has resulted in, uh, in, this, in a situation that young socialist, uh, especially socialist party uh, aldermen, 
uh, became into power. And in the 70s, a lot of, uh, of very talented architects, uh, like Fritz, for instance, um, um, went into the public service, like the council architecture uh, office, and started to design within the council um, urban designs and architecture. And um, on the moment that um, <coughs> the, the privatization wave started, uh, there was an enormous uh, uh, migration uh, between civil servant and private uh, decision makers. So in this moment, you have a situation in Holland where an arbitrary project developer and an arbitrary alderman uh, on, the, on the field of, uh, of, of public space in uh, politics, an arbitrary uh, urban designer and an arbitrary contractor uh, can be the same person uh, who, has, uh, who has spent uh, five years in each of these categories. And, and uh, yes, uh, so so this uh, this is extremely important because uh, this means that there is a very uh, in, uh, in in contrary to other countries there is a very close um, consensus level or or uh, maybe you should reverse it there is a kind of very uh, small margin of conflict between uh, the most conservative contractor and the mo most modern architect um, because uh, they are each other's uh, years uh, stu co-students uh, very often. And this is the most important, one of the most important factors uh, that this kind of, uh, that this kind of system is now, uh, has, has had a relative success up to now. But there's, there's a very strong tendency coming up that goes into the other direction. Yesterday there was a page size article about uh, Poundbury in, uh, in Holland, in the biggest magazine, which was very positive. And there have been published two books by very, um, very considered modern, engaged directors uh, of, of, uh, of uh, building companies about uh, producing more romantic uh, architecture. Um, and there have been cases, uh, court cases, in which I was involved um, in which uh, we tried by a municipality to impose architecture selection on clients, um, um, which, were, uh, which were put court uh, by these clients, and they won this for the first time since uh, 15 years, which means that we have to accept their architects. So. <coughs> well, I do remember Will Allsop saying the great thing about going to a planning office these days in Britain is that you know you're quite likely to be dealing with somebody who took quite a lot of drugs. Um, okay, Martin Richardson. Um, is this working? Yes. Um, this follows rather from Casey's remark. Um, it, it seems that the Dutch scene is, is based on sense and consensus in, in a way that there's a basic common sense even in the most progressive architecture and that's um, it, it, and it certainly goes into the building industry and that's one reason why their buildings are so extraordinarily much more economical than ours. It's also somehow it seems to me in, in uh, Dutch schools of architecture this sense this building sense and sense of form uh, can be developed so rapidly in, into all the variations which you saw in the, in the last uh, lecture and the whole thing seems to work right through and they have this secure sort of platform of sense and consensus. In this country, sadly, as it even said, over the last tw 20 years, we seem to have lived in a sort of uh, nightmare compounded of uh, nostalgia uh, and, and, and fear, on the, perhaps on the part of the uh, public, and uh, irresponsib a growing irresponsibility which is a somehow flight from that on the part of the architects. So that when architects do have a go, or even when they fantasize about having a go, they do these um, extraordinarily um, uh, irresponsible uh, proposals, say, for, for housing. And of course, housing is basically a staple, and it has to be based, based on sense. So it seems to me, although there are now perhaps some uh, good signs, as, as, as Paul was saying in, in Greenwich, it's going to be a long time to build this um, sensibleness and sense again, um, out of which something seriously creative could happen. It's got to happen in the, uh, the, the, the schools as well as in the uh, schools of architecture, as well as in the sort of public arena. 
Can I ask Gerard Prainer to make a comment now? Gerard, for, the, for those who don't know, can you just say what, what it is that you're doing in, in the Netherlands at the moment and how that came about, and then perhaps make a comment on you, how you find construction techniques, the, the, the attitude to building? Okay. Um, we won the European competition in 1992, and that project was finished about um, two years ago. Uh, and recently, within the last year, we now have another five or six quite large housing projects in the Netherlands. Um, and we're just about to build a, a project uh, in collaboration with a Dutch architect, Rolf Steinhuis, in, in London, in Thamesmead, using Dutch construction methods to see how it would relate uh, to this country. Um, I suppose one of the things I'd, I'd like to say as well, there has been a lot of discussion uh, about uh, Dutch architecture and why is it so good and why is it so terrible in, in this country and uh, are there any sort of easy answers that we can, uh, we can take. Um, it's very difficult to be precise when you're asked to, to compare um, or say something about a certain attitude in, in one country compared to another. And in order to make any point, you do have to make some sort of sweeping generalizations. Um, I mean, you could talk about the demise of the regional banking system, which Paul and I had a chat about last night within the UK as the reason for why regional development in this country is, is very difficult because funding is very difficult. You could talk about the economic divide between uh, a, a, the rich south of England and the more poorer north compared to a sort of more even spread of wealth found in the Netherlands. These could be factors that obviously affect uh, development and, and affect um, uh, your attitude or the uh, ambition towards what you want to build. But uh, one of the topics I'd, I'd, I think these could, be sub, could become subjects of seminars in their own right. Um, but one of the subjects I, I think they're a little bit in intangible to get into, especially for, for architects. Um, but one of the su subjects I would like to mention is, um, um, which I think architects understand, is something about a sort of support mechanism. Um, in the UK, um, the architect is very often left alone and is the only person sort of fighting a sort of losing battle um, for, a, for a, a achieving a sense of quality. And developers are completely free to, to pursue profit uh, as an end. I think we should not mistake that the developers in Holland are exactly the same and they would like to pursue as much profit as possible. It's just that you know, it's the society is controlled in a different way. It's not that there are a better group of developers in the Netherlands than, than, than here. Um, in the UK, uh, the planning departments don't plan and they only regulate, and the architect-planner relationship is, is, is confrontational. And um, also, the final planning committees that you go to are, uh, to get your approval are um, uh, full of lay people and, um, and without any design background. Now, the reverse of all of this is, is true in, in the Netherlands. Um, there's a top-down support system. Now, the priest mentioned the Stimulierings Fund is, is a government body which gives money to promote, to, to educate, mm -hmm. to educate the local councillors, to take them on trips, um, uh, so that, uh, to give money to various magazines so that, that people become aware of what's out there. And there's an awful lack of, there's a lack of awareness. Uh, the British public really don't really understand uh, what possibilities could exist because they're, they're not told. Um, so the local councillor becomes very aware and he then is promoting good design for his, his area. Um, and um, um, he then, in many way, instills the planning departments within those cities um, to be very active. Um, and cities have project bureaus, which uh, are, are set up to direct projects. They, in turn, um, employ people like Case Christiansen and Fritz Paulbaum as supervisors and urban designers. Um, and all of these parties then play a role in selecting the final architects for the plan. But they also all play a role in making sure that the, the developer has a very responsible is responsible towards the um, desires of the city. If the developer um, uh, doesn't respond to these desires that are set up by this large group uh, of people above him, well, he's not going to get any other jobs in that city. And if he does, he'll end up getting the prime locations in that city. So the developers have to play this 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 careful game because there's a lot of there's a lot of different levels of society 
telling them how they should be performing. Um, one further support, I mean the equivalent of the planning committee here, which I, which I mentioned is full of lay people, the, plan, the, the equivalent is full of uh, people with design experience. And my experience of, of those committees is always very, has been always very positive. Um, they very often have this, the same view as myself and, and can also be another uh, <laughs> helpful. <laughs> they can also be very, uh, but enormous help in persuading developers to go that stage farther and, and do something else, backing up, backing up your arguments as, as an architect. Um, so there's a, there's an, this enormous support above you allows, and also allows relatively young, inexperienced architects to be able to deal with these confrontational situation and be able to mediate between, between the client uh, and, and what the building is finally going to be built. And I, I think those are, that support structure is something that could be strengthened or put into place within this country and that's one thing that I see that, that could have fairly immediate results. And at the moment everybody's just left to fend for themselves um, and if you don't do what you're told we'll just get somebody else and there's enough people out there who'll say okay I'll take the job instead. Well, it sounds like a perfect world. Natalie, any comment on that? Yeah, I, I would also uh, stress something different. Is that uh, the fact that we managed to make uh, such a complex process out of designing uh, uh, housing areas, uh, a lot of things, um, changed the profession of the architect and the urban designer as well, because there's so many people involved, and there's so many safety net regulations and laws and regulations and uh, consensus things and written and unwritten rules, that architects and designers uh, are starting to become kind of jugglers, uh, I would say. With, uh, with all these uh, different aspects, and somehow you can stupefy your clients, almost, and municipalities with the results you can get from simply following all these rules. Um, so we become a completely different type of, 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 uh, of designers uh, in that way. We are uh, kind of designing uh, with, uh, with, given, uh, with given factors. And, and that allowed Kees Christiansen to, to, uh, to develop the Schuitgraaf uh, area, I think, in such a way that he uh, developed this phasing and, 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 and uh, the fact that he had to make percentages of green space instead of uh, specific spaces where to, uh, where to make them, enabled him to make kind of reservations with these common green areas on, on completely, different, uh, in completely different areas. So. Yeah, it's 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 a different profession we are uh, we are uh, working on. It's not 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 anymore an issue about style or or need where to put exactly the the furniture in the in the house. It's it, it's something completely different, I think. I, I agree with Natalie. Mm -hmm. I, I fully agree with Natalie because um, at this time we we use the calculator instead of the drawing board. And uh, we use more often the phone instead of uh, uh, making a model. And at least uh, using a calculator in order to design is a very important factor. And what what the last uh, issue of Argis was about the British uh, architecture. And what struck me very much is that N Mr. Nigel Coates uh, designed a house for the future. And it was in a way uh, very tragic because it was, <laughs> it was so tragic because it was about form. And it was instead of uh, about uh, leaving po living possibilities open and making uh, other forms of living possible. And he uh, designed the form. So what Mr. Coach uh, should do is uh, buy a calculator <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> instead of a drawing board. <laughs> I'm sure that message will be passed on by somebody. <laughs> um, yeah, S Steve, Steve Mullen.
I'm going to take that as a rhetorical question and take another one from the front here. There's a mic. There's a mic coming. Case, 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 would you like to comment on this? So this and this general question is, yes. which relates back to Steve Mallon's point about land. I mean, is there, an, is there a notion of, of periphery? I mean, when it's said that uh, in the Le Netherlands you think of the whole country, as it were, as one project, um, to what extent does that mean that these distinctions between urban, suburban, rural um, don't play a very large part in the way you're thinking about buildings or where you might develop? Yes, well, I always think it's very dangerous to uh, consider Holland as one project. Um, this, is an, uh, this is a kind of attitude that comes out of, uh, out of an uh, institution that's called Rijkswaterstaat. Um, and uh, it's, a it's, it's a state, it's a state in the state, more or less. Um, it's the civil engineering, it's the state civil engineering uh, ministry. And they have planned the, del the Delta Works to protect the country from, uh, from the water. And they are also uh, planning all the uh, uh, motorways um, and other um, in, uh, inter-provincial uh, uh, services. Um, and um, moreover, the, a department a side uh, aspect of this, uh, this state is, uh, the, uh, is the company that originally uh, realized uh, the big uh, land-winning uh, polders in which they also very uh, strongly uh, had a uh, hand in uh, developing the structure of the new towns that were realized there, at least in the, in the previous uh, uh, phase. And um, this, uh, this uh, people from, from this uh, generation have been evolved uh, to urban designers, and uh, from this corner is very strongly, uh, there's very strongly a wave uh, to consider the whole of the Netherlands as, uh, as one project. And um, I always uh, am a little bit wary of it because I think uh, you should, uh, you should uh, try to make a kind of balance between uh, centralist and, and decentralized um, uh, decision making. And that is the most important uh, um, task that we have in Holland, to, to really uh, keep a certain balance uh, between the uh, level of decision on the local uh, level and the decision making on, uh, on the uh, state level. So. In that sense, uh, I'm, uh, I'm more for, uh, for a kind of, uh, of, of categorical uh, division into that. Um, what was the question again? I think you answered yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Michelle and then Natalie. I actually want to uh, answer your question. I'd like to answer your question a little bit different. Um, as Nas Natalie already was claiming that not everything is uh, bright and pink in Holland. And what is very strange about this whole day um, is the fact that we're talking about housing as a specific category within our profession. And what would be more, maybe more liberating and more interesting is to uh, stop making it a division or a distinction between offices and housing, for instance. Maybe that answers your question because Let's say the, the, the difference between offices and housing in the first place is a quite, quite a stupid difference because um, why can't you, why can't you uh, live in an office or uh, work, work in a school or uh, 
uh, wor uh, live in the in the church because what's very strange we, we had the whole we had the whole afternoon we had discussions about uh, mixing mixing functions mixing mixing work and uh, dwellings but the fact is that due to uh, financial regulations you got uh, different commissions for offices and different commissions for housing and I think that's also due to financial regulations the same in England but if you're thinking about the future of working or the future of living the distinction between houses uh, and offices is actually quite quite stupid on the long run and maybe that could liberate also uh, the, the, the new towns or the new developing new developments either in Britain or in Holland from this kind of very narrow and categorical uh, limitations due to the fact that you don't call it housing or offices anymore but just space to be in. Uh, I found my... Uh, Case, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the, um, the, the, the fact that our society is, is ever increasingly uh, separated, we have we have the problem that um, um, when the Corbusier started to make his urban designs and uh, started to talk about functional se separa separation of the different uh, functional components, um, then uh, this was also a society uh, utopia. Um, and on this moment, we, are, uh, we have realized that uh, so, uh, a, m a certain mix of, uh, of society functions, different functions in society, is more uh, healthy for us. But the tendency of uh, our society structure is, is, is uh, on the moment, even more uh, directed towards uh, functional segregation. And this is a conflict that we can never uh, solve. Um, and a good example is, for instance, that um, also in the wake of these uh, Phoenix developments and central planning uh, developments, uh, the uh, big um, uh, office areas and big um, um, enterprise areas where big uh, sheds of production and distribution are planned um, are being distributed uh, uh, across the country, also uh, very often in relation to these uh, housing areas. and. Um, one uses uh, these components uh, in relation to each other um, to, uh, to make some uh, legislation uh, in relation to infrastructure, uh, sound, etc., et compatible. For instance, it is a common, uh, it's a common uh, way of planning to use office, uh, to use appeal of offices uh, as a kind of sound barrier for a housing estate. Um, and uh, all these kind of, 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 uh, of mechanisms are, are more or less fixed so that you get automatic patterns of uh, relationships between uh, different functional components. And this leads uh, automatically to a functional segregation, which is a very difficult uh, aspect to solve. Although I must say that at the moment also probably all of us or some of our offices are making studies of how to uh, combine again functions, especially around the uh, highway uh, areas. Yeah. Eh? Yeah. So it's 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 recognized as a, as a problem already. I think. Yes, but the problem is not, I think, to uh, to combine uh, the uh, conservative uh, functions to mix, like the pub on the uh, corner of the street and uh, the shop or the or the office uh, in the plinth uh, on the street level and housing above or something like that. But uh, the issue is uh, to, uh, to combine uh, harbor harbors uh, with oil tankers and, uh, and airports uh, with housing and uh, etc. Because that's, uh, th those uh, functions indicate the, uh, the definitive segregations or segregation of large functional components in our society. Gerald, um, I th sorry, I, I think uh, the question asked does show up one of the weaknesses in the whole planning procedure in, in the Netherlands in that um, uh, there isn't really a very good consideration of other uses and the housing areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, it still is a very old-fashioned zoning policy. Uh, a big area of uh, office development goes over there and housing is over here. Um, I think it's also, um, uh, when you think of the Netherlands uh, from this country, you think of, of, of the architecture in, in dwelling and in housing. And the quality within the office buildings and within other types of commercial uh, property is, is very low and much lower than the quality that you find uh, in, in the UK. And I'm not quite sure why that, uh, why that is the case. 
Okay, we'll take one more. Irene. No, we'll take two more, please. Well, you're going to have the last word, so you must hand over the you must hand over the mic now, right now. Thank you. Um, you were there were some observations which I'd like to make about the the countryside talk here. I guess it's very important. That in England, there is a very big lobby of the countryside, which probably in in, Hol in Netherlands is not in the same way. I don't know. Um, Maybe there is. The other observation is, it seemed to me that uh, in Holland, they understand the process of planning, building, and using much better than here. And it seems to me that in the architectural schools also, the combination of actually getting to know the production process is much more emphasized than here. And because of that, you seem to be able, and what Fritz was saying was, actually designing the process and not just designing a building. And that seems to be common in quite a lot of the presentations, that you design the rules, but not necessarily the building. And I think that's a very interesting uh, development. And I guess if, as architects, one really wants to keep on in the process of building, you have to know the process from the beginning to the end. And in England, they don't know very much about it yet. Maybe they do, but the builders are in control and not the architects. And the very strange thing in Britain is that you have a, you have a group of architects, you have a, a famous uh, group of architects in Britain who uh, are obsessed with the expression of building techniques. <laughs> and well, the expression, but not the knowledge of how to do it. Exactly. <laughs> Can we, can we just, just t take an answer on that as to whether, as to whether uh, Dutch architecture students um, have uh, an education and a training which makes them peculiarly suited to do housing, that they're knowledgeable about uh, concrete, etc., etc.? I derive uh, most of uh, the students that come in my office from uh, Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> because the level of Delft is very uh, controversial at the moment. Let's say, uh, I, I don't know, but, but um, what, what I, uh, re thinking about building process is uh, thinking about design strategies. So it's, I think it's more important to, to think about strategies, how to cope with the contractor, how to cope with the supply industry, and not necessarily to learn how, how concrete is being made. So I, I, I can't really answer your question. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any difference between uh, what students know in the Netherlands and what they know in this country. Most students leave university without knowing how to build anything, and they learn that through the first few years of office. Um, I think one of, one of the interesting things about uh, construction of housing, um, and if you see a number of different schemes, you'll find that actually the, the uh, materials used and, and the way that the buildings are constructed are very uniform through, um, uh, through the whole country. And the, the better architects know how to make, make a strategy uh, out, of, out of these materials uh, and know how to get the most out of them. So you're working with very limited parameters and doing very small things and making, in a way, very clever connections with a very limited palette of materials. The difference within the U with the UK, you, you start from scratch and everything is possible. You know, you're designing everything um, uh, as a one-off. And in the Netherlands, you're starting with a lot of givens. And I think every architect who starts to practice has to know what those givens are very, very quickly. Thank you. Irene, last question. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to come back to this issue about um, diversity and its relationship to lifestyles. And one thing strikes me is that on the one hand, Michelle, you have said that everything is space. Yeah? And it reminds me also of a discussion which is now starting, or perhaps has been going on for a while in Holland, about something which people call casco. So the idea is that you can build uh, a structure which then can serve every kind of purpose. It's like a glorified loft. Uh, on the other hand, um, much of the housing which we have seen today is really about the proliferation 
of types. Yeah? And what I still cannot get my hand on is what actually motivates this search of diversity and what are the, the, the factors this diversity is designed around. And it seems conflicting to this idea of something which might be generic like Casco. No, I, I would say if you look closely at it, 90% of the urban designs and the dwellings are variations on one theme and are not uh, different concepts. They are in fact mostly uh, more or less the same in program. What it looks like doesn't matter so much. Mm. Natalie? <laughs> Well, it's, um, it's of course two ways to go. Uh, you, you can either make a, a space which is so neutral that uh, anything could happen. But I think that what we try to design are, uh, are, are projects which have a kind of, um, give a kind of resistance almost. So the, so the shape of the, of the rooms and of the houses uh, more or less provoke uh, also the people who, uh, who live there. So we, um, our, our office started in 91 uh, with uh, working on a, on a European uh, competition. We designed a, a project in Berlin. And uh, what we didn't like about the first European competition is that everybody tried to design the ideal house. And we said, well, we can imagine that there are, are many ideals, uh, maybe uh, as much as, 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 as every, every person has, uh, has his peculiar taste. So we uh, set out uh, since then to uh, to make to make differences and not to uh, try to achieve the best or the ideal or the or the most uh, uh, average or, or whatever, but uh, simply to make to make differences and then people are grown up enough to to find their own uh, their own uh, their own way. I, I agree a little bit with uh, with Case that that indeed the differences are, are can be very uh, very small, but fortunately we we start to go beyond just for for room room houses eh? and 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 yes the margins are still small but you uh, notice now that, that clients um, yeah even start to ask for patio houses where in the in the past it was uh, almost forbidden uh, to make them so they they uh, yeah it's it's a slow process but uh, but I think it's uh, it's getting uh, it, it's improving it's, it's getting better mm. Well, then, on a, that almost cheery note, um, I think we're going to draw proceedings to a close. Um, impossible to sum up these days' events usually, but of course, I couldn't resist just running a little football analogy through my mind, uh, it being the FA Cup final. Um, and of course, I thought, ah, oh, the Dutch, they're going to give us total architecture um, <coughs> rather than uh, total football, and I think they have. Um, like the cup final this afternoon, it's been a game of two halves, uh, in our case punctured by or punctuated by lunch. And this morning we had the nature of the rules of the game explained, um, something about the terms and conditions and the dimensions and the funding. And this afternoon I think we've seen examples of uh, the players in action, uh, both individually but of course ultimately, as must always be the case, um, as part of a team. Um, happily, it's been friendly. Um, very few rough tackles, I think. Um, perhaps a, a minor rough tackle on Nigel Coates. Um, <laughs> but <coughs> I'm, I'm sure he can handle it. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow referee, Moise and Mostafavi, uh, for uh, conducting proceedings for, with his usual uh, efficiency. Uh, and, of course, uh, the promoter, Mr. Irene Scalbert, uh, whose name is, is pronounced in, in almost uh, more, more ways than anybody else in this building. We've had an excellent one today where we're, we're pronouncing the T now, He's Mr. Scalbert. Um, and uh, we, he, he does these things very well and organises wonderful symposiums. We look forward to the next one. So on all your behalf, may I thank uh, all the speakers uh, and... Uh, I was going to use that awful phrase, show your thanks in the usual way, but I don't think I have to use it. So, speakers, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.